So for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Beckford. I've been um, practicing cybernetics for 30 something years and um, wrote a PhD in the subject at Hull um, under the distant supervision and guidance of Professor Jackson um, in about 1990. Um, and I've made my living as a practicing consultant using cybernetic ideas ever since. Written um, now three books on the subject, the third of which will come out at, at Christmas and um, went to a meeting of the Cybernetic Society earlier in the year, didn't step back quickly enough when they were looking for volunteers and ended up as president. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> we are trying um, very hard and, and with some degree of success to bring a revival to interest in the ideas, application of the ideas um, across a whole spectrum of, of, um, of interests. And the what we've called the president series of events is, is a a set of devices really to engage the wider world in a conversation about what do we mean by cybernetics, what is it, and particularly, very particularly, what is its relevance to our organizations and our world today. Um, and so it's deliberately eclectic in its choice of, of speakers and presenters, um, and I hope in, it, in its argumentation as it wanders through. So it should be quite an interesting event. Um, there will be one of these every month, different speakers every month for at least the next 12 months, and we shall see, we shall see where we end up. But now I'm a minute late, so um, I will introduce the plan is we'll have a speaker, we'll have some Q&A after the speaker. Again, for the, for the Zoom um, newbies, there's a facility called chat in the bottom of your screen. If a question pops into your head and you'd like to ask it, rather than interrupting the speaker, if you fire it um, to me as a private message, when, uh, when we've finished the, the session, I'll come back and pick up those questions and we can ask them in some sort of organized fashion. But I stress it will be some sort of organized fashion. Um, so we're gonna have here from, from uh, Paolo da Costa, who is a, a fellow of the society uh, and an architect first, well, a bit of Q&A, then we'll hear from Professor Jackson, um, and then we'll, again, we'll, we'll interrogate you, Mike, on, on the difficult points of your talk, of course, um, and then we'll try and run a plenary at the end. And the idea of the plenary at the end is to try and bring back together um, the common threads from the, from the two very, very different yeah. speakers that we're going to hear from. So, Paolo, um, you might like to introduce yourself, and then we'll press on if there are no further questions. Good. Go. Paolo. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, Angus. Thank you, everyone, for your time, for being here. A uh, big thank you for the Cybernetics Society uh, for making this possible. My name is Paolo da Costa. I, is everyone uh, hearing, hearing me? Am I coming across well? Yes, yep. fantastic. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> I'm a practicing architect, which means that I am in, I am in the construction industry. Um, I, I don't teach, um, I draw, I make models, I go to sites, I speak with engineers and surveyors and clients and all that. Uh, I came across cybernetics um, about 10 years ago um, and I've been in love with it ever since and spending lots of money on books and uh, gainfully employing my time in studying it. My small talk, my, my little talk here is called From Architecture to Cybernetics and Back. <coughs> I hope I won't bore you too much. I'm going to start with um, telling you what I mean by this provocative little phrase very quickly. I'm going, to, I'm going to be telling you my theory very quickly. And then I'm going to share my screen and flood you with lovely images and use my voice over them to sedate you somewhat. So you, you don't turn too aggressive with your questions afterwards. <coughs> so let's start with cybernetics. Um, a little bird told me that a uh, Norbert Wiener had a weak spot for Phi Beta Kappa, the American Learned Society. And as you know, the, their motto uh, means, so it's Philosophia Bio Kubernetes, 
which means that the love of life, the love of knowledge is the guide of life. So Kubernetes is the key word there and it stands for guidance, for guiding. <coughs> this is important for me because my life is organized in uh, projects. So getting from A to B. And it's, it's very important to have guidance when you're going to from A to B, even though you're not absolutely sure from where you're coming from. And in the design world, sometimes or most of the times, you're not absolutely sure where you're going. You need to have this sort of sense of arrival and cybernetics is precious to me for that. So that's cybernetics and architecture. I have a a very peculiar take on architecture. I look at it like this. So from the Greek, we have our architecture comes from architecton, which means the um, prime builder or the principal builder or the first builder. I like this latest, this later take on it, the first builder or the principal builder, which means for me, the builder of the principal whatever is going on or is going, whatever is going to be built needs a foundation, needs a principle that will inform the process towards a particular end. And if, you, if you've worked with architects before, you will have noted with some interest that the architect is the guy that at the very beginning of the project gives you an, an image of the end in plans, sections, perspectives, models. So the architect's job <clears throat> is to define and to work on, develop the beginnings and the ends of projects, which are interconnected. So in my little theory, architecture takes care of the A, connects it to a B, and architecture is everything that's in the middle. Architecture is what informs the process of design um, in its economical dimensions, human dimensions, technical, scientific, procedural, the supply chains, even taste. <clears throat> so now I am going to share with you my screen and talk you through a uh, number of images, there we go, which, which are very important for me and hopefully, because this is a, an audience that, uh, let's, let's be honest, knows a lot more about cybernetics than I do at this point, hopefully you'll be able to lay or read cybernetic principles on many of the uh, subjects that I'll be touching on. I think everyone will be familiar with this image from Wittgensteinian rabbit duck. And it's something that I am very keen on, this sort of double um, edge to whatever comes to us from life. Is it a rabbit? Is it a duck? You can look at anything and look at, look at it as a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, this is something that I try to do always with any challenge. Um, there we go. This is uh, a plan, um, sort of a bird's eye view of the beginning of the architecture campus in my school in Porto. I studied in the University of Porto Faculty of Architecture. This is an old farm. To the left, you have the farm building. To the right, you have the modern building designed by our hero and the Pritzker Prize winner, uh, Alvaro Cesar Vieira. 
Um, our school is particularly has a, has, a, has a very peculiar bent in the sense that it sees itself as a bastion of rationalist architecture of the modern persuasion. So very clean lines, very few curves, if any at all. Very simple drawings. This is a zoom of the plan of the building. It's very small. It has three um, classrooms on, two, on one floor and another three in the ground floor. This is what it looks like. This is what I saw the first time I went into my school. This is just to show you and give you a flavor of um, um, what sort of informed, informed my progression as an architect. So as you can see, clean lines and the richness of the design, the effectiveness of the design, of the design is a bit on its drama and a lot on the uh, natural materials and the quality of the space and the light. This is one of the works by Alvaro Siza. Um, so as I said, we're looking at rationalist architecture of uh, very modern uh, architecture. The main, one of the main um, interests in the work of this architect is that he is the principal representative of a school of architecture, which is, goes by the name of critical regionalism, regionalism, which has to do with context and adapting to the context. So from this view of this building, it looks like a standalone thing. Um, unconnected to the traditional environment. But if I show you this other view, you can see that all of its being stems from this parapet line and the way that it aligns and grabs with this sort of late Baroque existing building. If the Baroque building wasn't there, this building would have been completely different. This is a school and the teaching of architecture in this school um, is it's really over there, it really both God and the devil are in the details, but it's not the sort of detail that you can actually see. It's the detail and the peculiarities of the strategy, the approach to the projects, to the problems that we need to solve. This is another peculiarity of our school. This is another project by Alvaro Caesar. As you can see, very simple, white walls. Um, lots of Portuguese people think it's utterly boring and devoid of interest. But then we have this bit. It's a small text from um, uh, Sir, the late uh, Saramago, the Portuguese writer who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I don't remember in which um, year. And he wrote this amazing thing about the work of Alvaro Caesar. So I'm not going to read everything. Just this. For Caesar Vieira, the wall does not oppose light. It is a space for contemplation that is not impervious to its external light. We find ourselves under the illusion that the building materials have become porous to the light, that the eye pierces the solid wall and connects inside, sorry, this is going mad, uh, connects inside and outside in one single aesthetic and emotional conscience where opacity becomes transparency. This for me is fascinating. With just a few words, this person changes the way that at least I look at this sort of space basically suggesting that we can go through and enjoy this building, imagining that these white walls with very clever um, administration of natural, natural and artificial light are translucent. That these very boring white walls actually allow the external light to come in. Perception to me is very important. This is one of my favorite and first books that I came across. Sorry, this is, this. 
complexity and contradiction in architecture very important for the for postmodern architecture and what's particularly surprising for me is that when i read this title ages ago i didn't read the word complexity as i'm read it now and indeed now when i went back to see the bibliography in this book um herbert simon was there <clears throat> This is the second of three books that are very important to me. This one is very alien to our school because it has nothing to do, in our school, the teaching has nothing to do with interior design and comfort and style. And this gave me an idea that comfort and whatever the human being touches in a work of architecture is of supreme importance. This is one of the modern masters, Mies van der Rohe, uh, sitting on another iconic modern chair and this tells me that he's taking his role a bit too 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 much to the extreme and that he's really not comfortable this is a third one um it, it's not translated into portuguese into spanish into english the title is the um, uh, Vari variations on identity and it's all about typology and in these sorts of architectural books, you have these amazing plates where um, different buildings of the same type, of the same family, are grouped together. So one can see both the resemblances and the differences. Um, this, again, takes us back to Wittgenstein's Duck Rabbit. This is a work by Marcel Duchamp. Is, it's his um, uh, self-portrait. It's a cutout of a sheet of paper where his face is the negative, so it's not there. But the, the way in which he cut this little piece of paper suggests his presence. Um, towards the end of my um, degree in architecture, I was completely bored with uh, spending sleepless nights drawing and I wanted to do a theoretical piece. At the same time, uh, I watched a talk by one of the most theoretically oriented teachers and he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't build at all. In, in our school, um, I'm afraid the, uh, the atmosphere is still the one that says that whoever can't do teaches. And even though it's a university, the way they resolved it is that most of the teachers have a thriving practice outside of school. But this particular teacher, he was a bit of the odd duck in the faculty. And in this particular talk, he um, was proclaiming quite, quite emotionally that whatever he did, editing books, organizing exhibitions, crits, etc. he did as an architect. Um, and this suggested to me that there was something fundamental in the work of an architect that really hadn't to do with the um, drawings and the construction, that it was about the strategy and the way of thinking. And uh, at around about the same time, I found my tutor, for the, for the thesis, who was working on a PhD thesis on the work of Charles Sanders Peirce, um, which I studied as well for my thesis. And this is the name that I've listened to being mentioned in cybernetic circles quite a lot, uh, mainly because of his concept of abduction, which I think is crucial. Um, so, as you all know, we have deduction, we have induction, and Peirce came up with the idea of abduction, which transcends both of them and has to do directly with the generation of hypotheses in science, in philosophy, in life. I think I have here, yes, exactly. Um, I, I won't go into this, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with abduction. But uh, abduction, oh, let me just go back. This book is fantastic as well. It's, uh, you can't imagine how happy I was when I decided to uh, do my a theoretical thesis, thesis on the um, thinking uh, sort of peculiarities of architects. 
and um, based on Peirce and also on Sherlock Holmes. So I was very happy to find this book by Umberto Eco, who was a dedicated fan of uh, Sherlock Holmes stories. And, um, and this is fantastic. This is a fantastic book. Um, this is another very interesting find. This comes from the depths of the um, critic of pure reason, where Kant wrote that about the architectonic of pure reason. And he wrote, by the term architectonic, I mean the art of constructing a system. So Kant saw architectonics, not architecture, as the art of systems. And he goes on to say, without systematic unity, our knowledge cannot become science. It will be an aggregate and not a system. Thus, architectonic is the doctrine of the scientific in cognition and therefore necessarily forms part of our methodology. Another crucial bit of information from my practice. And just to break the, uh, the ice that falls on us whenever one mentions Kant and the critique of pure reason, um, I just wanted to say that serendipity is crucial as well. This is just a picture that, of a place that I found by chance somewhere in London, um, an old basement courtyard that someone filled with uh, colored elastic bands. How wonderful is that? How inexpensive and how magical. So this is something that as an architect, I keep in mind. Um, quality of a place doesn't depend on on um, having heavy um, and broad means. This is a picture that represents a um, short story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Descent into, a Ma into the Maelstrom. Probably you're familiar with it. To me, it represents learning. It's basically a story of a um, seaman whose ship um, uh, goes under close to a uh, maelstrom in some stretch of open water and he gets caught and he starts being sucked down. But as the process takes a while, he starts observing, looking around how things are panning out. And he discovers, he abducts, that some sorts of shapes take longer to go down than some other shapes. Um, cylindrical shapes they'll take longer to go down the maelstrom so he grabs one of those shapes you can see him down there fighting for his life and um, eventually he manages to hold on to it long enough for the maelstrom to dissolve this is another chance encounter that i had on um, so it was somewhere by the thames uh, an exhibition on the work of uh, Ruskin. So this is um, an artwork by Turner. And uh, as you can see, it's very, lots of, there's lots of light, some color. Um, wouldn't mind having it in my living room. But then I sort of zoom in, zoomed in and read the notes that came with the picture, which read by this, like this. Ruskin attributed the beauty of Turner's most subtly colored work, not to his ability with paint, but to his initial documentation of clear facts in pencil. Armed with objective studies, turned, Turner could then allow his sensitivity to ever-changing conditions of light and color to emerge, creating an evocative impression of atmosphere and place. So, Ruskin was saying that the success of Turner's paintings came from his analytical capacity of geometrically analyzing whatever he was portraying. So now we go back to the picture and I swear now I can see structure, I can see buildings faintly, I can see that it's all very, very rigorous actually. So this little text completely changed the way I was looking at this artwork. 
This is one of the most famous houses in architectural, modern architect, architectural history. It's Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, this has to do with observers. Um, so as you can see, the house was very dramatically placed on, tro on top of a waterfall. The interesting information here is that um, that's not what the client wanted. The client had acquired the land with this fantastic waterfall and he wanted his house placed directly in front of the waterfall so he could, he could see it with, from his living room. So Frank Lloyd Wright, by placing the house on top of a waterfall, he not only changed the house, the position of the house, he changed completely the position of the observers. These are the tiny figurines um, that um, Alberto Giacometti kept making and destroying a long stretch of 10 years, I believe, in his career. Uh, I saw some of these alive at the Tate two years ago, I think. And this is another fantastic discovery for me in terms of perception. Um, there was a video in the exhibition where Alberto Giacometti was explaining to the interviewer that these are not tiny figurines. These are figurines of people that are very far away. Again, as in the Wittgenstein and duck rabbit and the Turner picture, um, a tiny bit of information completely shifts the perspective of what I was seeing. This is about the architectural tools um, architecture has a, a and, and technical technical drawing in general, really in engineering and mechanics, has a very peculiar way of representing objects that exist and that are to be made, which is the elevation and the section. So here on top you have an elevation of a very small tail. In the middle you have a horizontal section, which one calls a plan, a horizontal plan, and below you have a vertical section cutting the the object in half and showing us the internal mm -hmm. elevation. So these three in, independently and independently, they represent three different aspects of the same object. And the three together, they represent more when they are together than each one of them can represent individually. This is another type of section. I'm sure you, you know this story as well about, uh, it goes back to the Second World War. Um, um, war planes were coming back um, with damage on their um, fuselages. And um, the people who were working on the maintenance on, of the airplanes wanted to reinforce the bits that had been attacked. Uh, but the clever engineer figured out that there was information missing, that the bits of the planes that had to be reinforced were the bits that hadn't been damaged because those were the planes that hadn't returned at all. Um, so it's interesting to keep in mind to me that this is also a section. The, the figure of the plane shows in the white dots, shows the places where the bullets intersected the, the airplane. A similar type of representation two minutes, Paolo. is, okay, thank you, John. A similar type of representation is this. This is a Poincaré section. So again, just like this is a section and the middle image is a section, this is a section through a um, one of Edward Lorenz's strange attractors. Each of these dog dots represents not a dot, but um, a trajectory. So it's a section through one of these uh, um, curves. And 
this is interesting to me because this is now how I see uh, problems that I have to deal with. There are there's a peculiar system with a, a particular system with many people or things working on it. Slightly chaotic. One thing can go left or go right, but the way I try to deal with these problems or challenges is to make a section and the section in time and go to time X and seeing what's going on. If this element shouldn't be here, I go and analyze what's going on in this X section of time and space and what can I place here to prevent this element to be here and to go wherever I want it to be. So this is just a representation of a section in time and some sort of security rail would be helpful here to prevent these uh, two friendly friends from falling. This is about another concept that is very important for my practice, which is figure and ground. This is a, a project nearing completion here in London, and we see a bit of brickwork. The brickwork uh, that we, you, we see here came from a careful selection of many different types of bricks. And the funny thing for me in this particular project at, it was that the ground for the bricks, which is the grout, was subject to the same type of scrutiny that the choice of bricks um, uh, implied. So the grout that you see here, which doesn't seem very impressive, is one of 24, 20 odd samples that we had to do. So this made me think of the bricks, not as the foreground, but as the background for the grout which was the hero at the time that I was working on it. So focus shifts within a single problem, within a single system, depending on, on what is the goal that we are trying to achieve, what is needed. Um, this is a little staircase that exists somewhere in Switzerland that I designed. It's uh, plaster over a prefabricated uh, MDF uh, symbol structure. And this all came from a Baroque, lovely uh, existing uh, bookshop that I spent many hours as a teenager in uh, Porto, Portugal. Um, just lastly, um, I'm sorry that I didn't speak a lot about um, cybernetics, but I, I trust that you were able to detect some, some of the concepts that are peculiar to it in, in these small, in this uh, little ex exposition. Just wanted to share with you this um, little quote about books and about theory. Um, I'll just read the last bit to end. The original and natural idea of knowledge is that of cunning from the, from the, or from the, class, from the Greeks, I mean. The original and natural idea of knowledge is that of cunning or the possession of wits. Odysseus is the original type of thinker, a man of many ideas who could overcome the Cyclops and achieve a significant triumph of mind over matter. Knowledge is thus a capacity for overcoming the difficulties of life and achieving success in this world. And this to me is what cybernetics is all about. Thank you very much. Okay. How did I do it, John, in terms of time? Oh, I'm back. Thank you, Paolo. Um, I've, I've written some, some thoughts down and nobody sent me a question yet, but there are a couple of observations coming through, um, which I can pick them up on the screen. Um, Mr. Battle, wherever you are, I can't see you on my screen at the moment. Did you want to say something about uh, about your, your, your reflections there? Uh, yes, yeah, so my reflection does relate Paolo's talk back to cybernetics, I believe. Um, although on reflection, maybe more phenomenology. Um, so as you were talking, um, I was lulled into this kind of meta space that you were talking about. <laughs> You've got a lovely voice. And um, so I was thinking about 
traditional AI and the kind of the way AI uh, holds that we, you know, we're kind of solipsistic and we only perceive the world through representation. Um, but a kind of a more cybernetic view or stroke phenomenological view is that we we perceive the world directly. So what is the role of representation um, in that world? Oh, we have somebody waving. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just That's right. to, to, to know if it's possible to ask a, a, a question at this point. Or yeah, I, I or, can respond to both questions um, you. after you speak. Go ahead, Janos. Oh, thank, you, thank you very much. Had, had Steve finished? Oh, sorry, are you finished? <laughs> no, no, I, I have finished. No, he was right. interrupted, that's all. No, so no, no, let's let Steve finish. Yeah, after you finished. So, so I, I was kind of just one sentence to round that off. Then, um, uh, yeah, you didn't mention phenomenology, but is phenomenology kind of part of your thinking? Full stop. There we are. Janos, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. At the beginning, Paulo, you mentioned that um, guidance is needed when you are engaged in uh, getting from A to B and uh, before you launch into your uh, architecture and the rest of it. And uh, I expect that th these are instances of cybernetic activity. Uh, you, you would agree with that, I think. That's uh, Definitely. the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is that, do you agree that in both of these activities, there is an instant uh, a very uh, intense problem solving is going on. Would you agree with that as well? Um, yes, I think I'll, I'll respond in the in reverse order. Problem solving. Um, so I was saying in the beginning, that in, in my little world view, it's about going from A to B and that architecture is involved in defining and refining and changing and adapting our representation of A, of B, so we can relate it to A and the, the path that we take from one to the other is where cybernetics is most helpful. It's where problem solving, um, happens because in architectural work um, there's this weird superposition of anticipation and prediction so in a way we are defining the future but we also need to anticipate it because we need to design also the processes of building and manufacturing and this is where representation comes. Um, going back to Steve's um, um, observation, representation is, is crucial. It's architecture. Um, when we are in the define, let's define B moment and uh, let's refine A moment, we can never grasp the totality of the end product. What we have is a series of uh, models representing different dimensions of projects. And a bit like the, the three drawings for the little temple that I showed, they don't show the same things. Uh, we can only have the end product when we look at all the models in, in, um, in, in conjunction at the same time, when we cross reference. And we have drawings and we have written pieces, we have budgets, we have legal documents and um, representations are never complete and uh, they need to um, take into consideration as many dimensions of, um, of <clears throat> existence as possible, social, economical, mechanical, chemical, physical. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, answered I think that's the best I can do. Oh, in terms of phenomenology, um, was it, I, I'm not very well read on that. Is it Husserl, Hus, Husserl that uh, um, 
So I think it Husserl, which had the, the phenomenal, phenomenological, um, uh, I don't, can't remember the word, but you, you sort of bracket some aspect of whatever you need to consider, isn't it? And concentrate on that mm -hmm. and forget everything else. So totally, that is what our models do. When we do a 3D model, we're not looking at uh, electrical systems or sewage systems. Etc. So everything, all of that is put in su suspension and we deal with that in a different model. And then we need to look at all the models um, together as architects. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Paolo. Anybody else want to come in? Yeah, I wouldn't, Paolo, uh, certainly my experience in BT uh, with problem solving is that normally when I'm really right involved with this, trying to understand the solution, initially I was given the problem. But I was just wondering how maybe you do tie the two together, which is problem formulation uh, with problem solving, because again, they're not really independent activities in themselves. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, it's part of the architect's brief to craft the brief, <laughs> so yeah. to speak, with sure. the client. Yeah. Everything is up in the air. Yeah. Um, and uh, in architecture, it's amazing what one stroke of the pen can represent. It can represent a concrete wall. It can represent a bamboo fence mm -hmm. or, um, you know, an, an air barrier in a, in a shopping mall. Yeah. So uh, in terms of crafting the brief, it's, it's, a, major, it's a major task for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Depen I could Depen imagine... Yeah. You, you must have many interesting uh, sort of conversations, say, with a structural engineer, if you were designing something that was really, you know, sort of structurally sort of evident, you know, yes. because it could be, you've got to, I mean, you do, you, there is ongoing dialogues between the two. You might be saying this is the type of shape I would like, but it's just not possible, you know, the, 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 the dynamics won't with, allow with it. So on, yeah. With structural engineers, we have fantastic talks. They I can imagine that, are yes. tr tremendously reliable fellows yeah. and they design their stuff and then we let them rest and then two weeks afterwards we come back and say listen we can't really have that amount of concrete there because of this and that and they say oh okay yes we can shave off 100 mil <laughs> it's okay so they always yeah. over specify but in terms of conversations and crafting the brief for instance my last interesting conversation with potential clients had to do with uh, convincing them not to do the bloody rear extension because their house was wonderful and who cares if the uh, renewal date for their mortgage was up? <laughs> yeah. Who cares? They have a wonderful... <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I successfully convinced them not to engage me to ruin their house. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So that is an extreme way of crafting the brief, <laughs> yeah. if you will. And that's the system working, of course, in a very positive way there. That's the, the, the yeah. entire system working and coming to a different conclusion by exactly. defining the system, inclu including these people, of course, that would be included within your system. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Hey, boy, anybody else want to come in? Okay, so I've, I've got one sitting here, Paolo, where I'm, I'm just sort of intrigued by the, the, the architect's take on, on the interaction of purpose, identity and structure. You sort of touched on it a couple of times with, with some, of the, uh, some, some of the work. How do you resolve the sort of the, the, the tension, if you like, between those three things? Purpose, identity and structure. Oh, Lord. Um, can I take style? <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to ad lib on style is a very interesting thing. Everybody, at least uh, the people that I admire in the architectural world, they claim not to have a style. Some of them claim to have emergent systems of designing projects in their practices where there isn't a figure of the um, master architect who scribbles something uh, brilliant on a napkin and hands over to his minions to take forward. But the, the, the surprising truth is that the end products always surprisingly resemble themselves. They, they, there wouldn't be any other way because they come from the same system. And it's very interesting. Not sure if I'm coming across correctly. It's a bit like a French or an Italian chef claiming that he can cook everything in the world but you somehow you never get sushi in an italian restaurant 
So, uh, yeah, whenever you, you get engaged, I would say that the supreme luxury in, in developing a, an architectural project is to have not one architect, not two architects, but three architects. That is the supreme luxury. And my, my favorite houses all come from the cooperation of different um, designing heads. It's the only way you can get the suitable sort of true variety. Mixing, adding two systems or three, ideally. Okay, so I think yeah, that's a, for me the the um, the dependency of the outcome on the observer in the first place. So yes, if you're an Italian architect, you're going to end up with with Roman columns, I guess. And if you're an Italian chef, you're going to end up with pasta. Um, Something like that. Is, is, it, is it that deterministic, or is, is there some freedom of choice there? There's a, there's a spectrum. But for instance, I worked with a classical architect here in London, and once I overheard him comment to um, one of his clients saying, if I ever, you know, a, a classical architect, so he builds, a, he does new build uh, Georgian architecture in the 21st century. And I overheard him say to a client, if I ever see someone here being creative, I fire them <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> As, it's that's, an, a good point. That's, that's a good point to stop on that one, Paolo. <laughs> thank you very much. I don't know how you show your appreciation on uh, on Zoom. We can look like we're clapping, can't we? And saying thank you very much, yes. to Paolo, for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, we're going to move to, I suspect, what will be a very different place. Um, so uh, Mike Jackson, um, Emeritus Professor at the University of Hull. Um, the title is um, Organizational for Cybernetics Past, Present and Future and came about because Mike and I had a chat when I, when I invited him to, to speak tonight. Um, and um, I think we would all recognize that cybernetics has had its challenges over, over recent years. And one of the things we're trying to do is explore and understand relevance and meaning um, to the contemporary world. Uh, and Mike, um, a very deep thinker on all things systems. So really over to you at this point, please. Okay, I just need to get the technology to work. There we go. It's always the most worrying part of this, these presentations. Mm. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, my, I, I remember today that I was at some stage a, a fellow of the Cybernetic Society, although I was saying to Angus, I couldn't find my letter of uh, confirmation, so I shall, I shall need another one of, of those. But it, it's great to see the Society um, getting back on its feet. Um, and again, thanks to Angus for that. And, and I certainly wish John Beckford um, every success as its new, as its new president. Um, uh, especially as when John was a baby, uh, he, he studied at uh, Hull University, his PhD, and of course we taught him everything, uh, everything that he knows. So, uh, although he's forgotten some of it, I think. But this, this is a very different talk. Um, and it's a, it's a wide ranging talk uh, about the significance of cybernetics in, in the social domain. So I, I'm interpreting organization uh, very broadly to refer to societal systems, organizational systems, uh, and social systems ge ge generally. Um, and uh, one comment before I start, this, this is very much a, a UK, US uh, view of uh, cybernetics. Cybernetics, of course, is big in other countries, particularly in the Soviet Union. And um, uh, Bogdanov um, came up with the notion of the bioregulator, which in, in, uh, he was a Russian revolutionary, uh, which anticipated Wiener's negative feedback by some, some time. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, this is a, this is a UK, US oriented talk, I'm afraid, just because I simply don't know enough about, for example, the Russian approaches to cybernetics. And, uh, and to make sense of cybernetics in the social domain, I, I've also, I'm afraid, got to classify cybernetic approaches uh, because cybernetics, uh, uh, some early proponents of cybernetics thought that it could be a supradiscipline, which is the word I think used in the blurb 
uh, for these talks. Um, but it's not turned out that way. So we, we do have different types of cybernetics uh, and there are different ways of classifying them. Uh, often they're classified according to the approach to information. So if you take an information theory perspective, such as Shannon, then you're, you're concerned about channel capacity and, and passing clean messages uh, when noise is involved. Um, if on the other hand, like Bateson, you, you, in, you, in, you embrace meaning, and actually I think Vina did as well, uh, then, um, then you come within a different class for many people. At the recent World Organization of Systems and Cybernetics, people were talking about third and fourth and fifth order cybernetics, which certainly baffled me, because uh, I'm not quite sure how many orders we're going to um, end up with. Anyway, my classification is based, uh, first of all, on, on von Furster's uh, distinction between first order and second order cybernetics, but then also um, uh, what was for me an enlightening uh, extra distinction uh, brought in, in Andrew Pickering's book, Cybernetic Brain, where he identified a particular strand of British cybernetics, which had a different uh, way of going about, uh, going about things. And certainly, helped me to rethink my appreciation of what Stafford Beer's viable system model uh, was, was about. So I'm going to go through these different um, orders of cybernetics. And, and this may seem old hat to many of you, but what I, what I think may be original is, is drawing out what I think are the main achievements of these different types of cybernetics, which have lasted uh, and continue to be of significant interest in the modern day. So what is first order cybernetics? We all know following von Furst that it's the cybernetics of uh, observed uh, systems. And as it's usually um, portrayed, it, it, it was a search for objective knowledge uh, that permitted greater control. So that was what Wiener was interested in when he was looking at anti-aircraft gun systems. And it, it's the way that uh, People like McCulloch and Walt, uh, Gray Walter and Ash, Ashby uh, looked at it for the most part when they were considering uh, the way that the, the brain worked. Uh, they, they wanted, through their mechanical models, to gain objective knowledge about the way the brain worked. And, and to that extent, it, uh, this was not... not anything too radical in that it was an extension of the traditional scientific model to embrace purposive, uh, purposive systems, those that appeared to be capable of achieving a, a goal, <clears throat> whether they were machines, organisms, or societies. And the way that um, uh, teleology was made a respectable uh, part of science was through the notions of communication and control. Uh, which Wiener, uh, which Wiener set out in the book uh, Cybernetics. Uh, this form of uh, cybernetics was at its high point in the Macy conferences, uh, which McCulloch shared and which Wiener uh, and, and Ashby certainly attended, and, and um, of course social scientists such as uh, Margaret Mead and, and Gregory Bateson, who at that time were interested in uh, bringing more rigor to social sciences by um, by looking at the uh, the methods of the natural sciences and the, the, the notion of purposive systems and, and how they were possible <laughs> in cybernetics uh, was very attractive uh, to them. Uh, and uh, they had great confidence in their machine models, of course, uh, that they were getting objective knowledge. Uh, Wiener uh, thought that his um, anti-aircraft uh, system was, was a better way of uh, shooting down enemy planes. People like Walter and Ashby uh, had such belief in their machine models of the brain that they were willing <coughs> to engage in, um, uh, in, in uh, or to encourage perhaps this approach such as lobotomy, which was cutting out certain circuits in a, uh, in a, in an electrical system, uh, and to see that as an, uh, uh, as a model which could be used to justify um, 
taking out certain aspects of the brain, a bit worrying to us perhaps these days. And this first order cybernetics uh, really um, started to decline in the US when it went off into all kinds of other, uh, other sub-disciplines, such as information theory, artificial intelligence, control engineering, bionics, robotics, prosthetics, uh, and has, according to Klein's uh, excellent book, The Cybernetics Notion, uh, still obtains in uh, the IEEE's uh, Society of Systems Man and Cybernetics. So I haven't looked at their stuff recently to make uh, the judgment of what they're, much they're doing. Anyway, the, the, the achievements of first order cybernetics for me, um, uh, management cybernetics, uh, the, the first attempt to apply uh, and I'm in the social domain, remember, so I'm, I'm looking at it from that point of view. Management cybernetics, first attempt to apply cybernetics to management, and this was the, this was the uh, input transformation output models uh, and the use of feedback by an external controller to, uh, to, to set a goal and to enable the system to, um, if it's set up correctly with all the elements of feed, negative feedback system, to achieve its, to achieve its goal. Through, um, through, through regulation. Um, the controller there being uh, essentially out, the, uh, the decision maker being outside the, outside the system. Uh, and um, it's old hat now, but my God, um, the, the use of uh, properly designed feedback systems has still got a lot to teach us uh, in management. And when they're not applied and developed properly <clears throat> in organizations, all kinds of things uh, go wrong. Um, my, my second um, reflection comes from reading uh, Klein's book, the, the Cybernetics Moment, uh, and he talks about how ideas, those the ideas at the, at the time of Wiener and, and, the, and the revolution in cybernetics and the Vasey conferences about the birth of a cybernetic society, uh, and Klein talks about how, uh, in various ways, they eventually became uh, this, that became the discussion of the information society and of course today we have a discussion of a new type of society based upon AI and uh, and, and big data uh, and, and it strikes me that the same sort of issues um, exist in and ways of talking are useful in discussing the cybernetic society the information society and contemporary society uh, and Wiener put his um, Put his finger on most most of these in the, in his book the human use of uh, human beings uh, and that's a quote from towards the end of that book from Vina. the hour is very late and the choice of good and evil knocks at our knocks at our door mm -hmm. um quite quite a statement i think uh, 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 and it was of significant concern to Vina. Vina, Vina, i think was is the most impressive of these early cyberneticians in, in the scope <clears throat> of his <throat> understanding of philosophy and of the range of applications of cybernetics to machines, organisms and societies. And in the human use of human beings, uh, he looks at many of the issues that we society confronts today uh, in looking at AI and, and big data and, and what people are saying about how those might transfer, transform the way that societies operate. He was a very ethical person, uh, Vina, and he was reflecting all the time, and not surprisingly as a cybernetician, on the circular relations between cybernetics uh, and, and society. He wondered what impact cybernetics might have on society and, and, and how society might use cybernetics. He was an ethical person himself. He, uh, he, he refused um, uh, money and grants from the uh, military. Um, he uh, raged against McCarthyism in, in the United States. And that's not true of many of the early cyberneticians. Uh, McCulloch was a, uh, was right wing, uh, uh, a cold warrior, a cold war warrior. Uh, von Furster's Biological Computer Laboratory was funded mainly by Air, Fa Air Force grants. But Wiener worried about all these things, and he worried about cybernetics providing tools in the hands of what he called machine-like men, uh, giving uh, elites 
ways of controlling other people in society. He worried about game theory, for example, in the, in the hands of machine-like men in the Soviet Union in, and in the US, uh, using it uh, in ways that could bring about mutual destruction. He talked about the central, centralized control of information, uh, which could only hold back a society in terms of its development. Uh, he talked about the human use of human beings, the, the name of the book, uh, let's use these new tools and technologies to increase uh, leisure time and, and freedom and, and a better life for people, uh, rather than putting them out of work or making them the slaves of machines. Uh, I was surprised to find a notion of uh, second order learning in the human use of human beings. I associated it with Argyris and, and, and Sean, but it's there in, um, in Wiener's book. And of course for Wiener, um, information was uh, <coughs> negative entropy. Uh, and he talks about how machines and organisms and, and societies are islands of negative entropy capable of greater organization. But in, in achieving greater organization, they at the same time contribute to the increase in entropy overall. And that could be expressed in terms of, for example, the exhaustion of natural resources. And uh, he tells the story in the human use of human beings of uh, Alice's uh, mad tea party, where the, the mad hatter and the March Hare sitting in their chairs and having eaten all their cakes and drank all their tea, then move round to the next set of chairs and which are empty and drink all the tea and eat all the cakes there and so on round the table. And uh, Alice asks, what are you gonna do when you return to your original spot and there are no cakes and no tea left? And of course, the March Hare changes the subject and we're still changing the subject mm. today. Second order cybernetics, um, uh, what is it? It's the cybernetics of observing systems, according to von Furster. Uh, I mean, people have been paying attention to observing systems uh, throughout the history of philosophy. Um, Paolo mentioned Kant's critique of uh, pure reason, so I'm going to mention it as well. Um, there we have an account of uh, an observing system, and Husserl's phenomenology concentrates on observing systems. But I suppose because uh, it was concerned with circular feedback systems, it was inevitable that cybernetics would get round to uh, the notion of studying observing systems as well at some <coughs> stage. Uh, and people like Maturana and Varela uh, have given biological, I've done biological work which demonstrates experimentally uh, that we have no clear representational uh, view of the world. Um, it, it, it depends upon the mechanism through which we observe uh, the world. Uh, living is cognition for, for them. Uh, we interpret the world in particular ways. We decide um, because of the way we're constituted, uh, decide to react to certain things in the world and to ignore others. And to that extent, we construct our own uh, reality responding to the environment according to the way that we're organized and, uh, and structured. And this is a kind of, uh, that organisms work that way, according to Maturana and Varela. Uh, and this subjectivist epistemology is also the case for human beings, according to uh, Maturana. Uh, anything said is said by uh, an, ob an, an observer. You, you have to look at the observer and where they're coming from uh, to have any chance of understanding what it is uh, that they're saying. Uh, and for him, science is just another form of languaging. It depends upon a consensus between different observers. It doesn't reach out and, uh, and achieve any objective truth. This was the kind of approach um, the Biological Computer Laboratory set up originally for other purposes, but this uh, this kind of approach emerged at the Biological Computer Laboratory. Uh, and von Furster, in a sense, was the person who's, who saw the 
relationships uh, and provided the common language for second order cybernetics, drawing upon the work of Maturana and Varela, their experimental work, the, the frog's eye, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. So uh, von Glassersfeld, he understood his, his Kant uh, uh, et al. Uh, his work on constructivism was drawn upon. The rather eccentric Spencer Brown's work uh, has appeared important with it to set certain second order cyberneticians. Uh, and Lumen drew heavily upon that, and I'm, I'm going to come on to that. Uh, the uh, second order cybernetics is heavily represented in the American Society for Cybernetics, um, almost exclusively so. And at one stage, it seemed to have a, a, a way of excluding anybody who wasn't a second order cybernetician, which I think was a mistake, and I'm sure. The, the Cybernetics Society won't go that way. And according to Klein, uh, this American Society for Cybernetics, and I think he's right, uh, has a precarious existence as a radical epistemology. Second order cybernetics has it there. And incidentally, the American Society of Cybernetics was set up by the CIA, uh, another interesting um, note. Uh, achievements there. Uh, von Glassersfeld and um, uh, Maturana, Maturana and von Forster are always going on about um, uh, because we, 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 we create the world, we bring forth a reality about the personal responsibility and ethics of doing so. Uh, now, there are sort of varying views of how important this is, uh, how important this insight is. Um, Byrne and Callahan, who Right about complexity theory, said that on its own it's rubbish. Um, Bergson makes a more sensitive point that we really have to look at the limitations on the distinctions that humans can make. So I think there's a lot of self-indulgence in some of this second order cybernetics uh, in, the, in the sense that um, people born in a slum in Calcutta uh, are able and have access to many fewer and are taught and educated in a way which allows them to draw forth a different form of reality and a much more limited reality than others in other circumstances. The distinctions to which they have access, the limitations on the distinctions are, 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 are great. And uh, at the moment, uh, second order cybernetics has no methodology. Uh, in the sense that if you wanted to put its, its thinking into practice, you, you soon get stuck. Um, I, I think the greatest achievement of social second order cybernetics is actually the fact that it's managed to infuse um, social theory. Uh, and particularly in the work of uh, Lumen. Uh, Lumen was a social theorist. Uh, th th there were, of course, social theorists who drew primarily on cybernetics, such as Karl Deutsch's political theory. Um, not, not much going on there now in that area. Um, the, mostly uh, people have gone back into their, back into social theory uh, and they draw upon cybernetic ideas. Well, so social theory is first and cybernetics is second and general system theory is second and whatever the drawing on. Uh, and that was the case with Lumen. Um, he, he was a social scientist. He, he trained, he, he studied for a year under Parsons and the social theory of um, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, etc. was his starting point. However, he has transformed that into uh, the most wide ranging social theory and most interesting, in my view, social theory that exists today. Um, he's replaced the part whole distinction with the system environment um, distinction. And he sees society as not fundamentally any longer stratified between classes, but uh, between function systems. And these function systems, uh, such as the law, politics, economy, science, the media, are autopoietic systems uh, constituted by communications. And so they bring forth different worlds um, and uh, seek to preserve themselves as they reduce the complexity of the external world. And they're very difficult for human beings to, uh, to budge. We can irritate them, but they do go their own way. And the separation of these function systems, according to Lumen, makes it difficult to 
respond to grand societal challenges such as climate change, because the function systems all interpret and react to climate change in their own ways. Politically, it's hard to manage because you've got elections every few years, economists see it differently, science sees it differently, and they, they react to it in different ways. So that creates a, a, a great difficulty um, as far as um, uh, as far as, as human beings being able to uh, ex exhibit agency and to react to challenges. His work's also being used interestingly in organizational analysis to see when a, an organization which has to uh, restrict its complexity to get on with its purpose and its tasks and they uh, can cut it off from its environment and, le and lead to it for exact, perhaps ignoring issues of social responsibility. Uh, and particularly with this, with, with, with Lewin's theory, uh, he, he, you have to have a second order analysis. You, you, you look at how first ob order observers observe, and that's, the, that's what sociology should be about for Lewin. So people like um, uh, Durkheim, Weber, uh, uh, Habermas, uh, give you first order accounts of the way society is. Uh, Lumen is interested in what these first order accounts say, the distinctions used by these first order, by these first order analysts, uh, and, and what that means about what they say about the nature of um, society. Um, drawing heavily now on um, Pickering's book, um, The Cybernetic Brain, well, there's a third type of cybernetics, uh, which, which he calls British cybernetics, um, which is, is different in, in orientation. It doesn't seek uh, ob ob objective knowledge in the same way that science does. Uh, the, word, the word performative is used. We're, we're concerned about how things perform, um, with how the brain if it's working well, uh, enables human beings to adapt to their environments. And it's the, the focus is on adaptation rather than uh, rep representation. The brain is a, an adaptive organism, not, not, a, not something that seeks to, to create an objective representational view uh, of, of the world. Uh, and, in, and in that logic, um, systems explore each other's uh, possibilities. So an organization can explore the possibilities of its environment and the environment will draw upon the organization as it, as, as it evolves, see what it's capable of, uh, of doing. Uh, and uh, we learn through this process. In Heidegger's terms, this is a, a philosophy of revealing. Um, we, we can't know any absolute truth, but we can start to un unfurl or reveal the truth through interactions uh, between different systems, rather than the traditional view of science and first order cybernetics, which is more fra in framing, uh, more trying to gain objective truth about something and then predicting and controlling how it behaves. So um, Stafford Beer, who is concerned with what he, he said, cybernetics is concerned with exceedingly complex probabilistic systems, which were unknowable, the behavior could not be predicted. Um, in, in this interpretation of his work, sees the way that organizations develop in their environments uh, as being in, in the making, uh, as something that's being revealed as the organization performs and interacts with its environment. Uh, this form of cybernetics um, came about had, was discussed in, in the Ratio Club in, in the UK, which was set up, uh, interestingly, for those who had Wiener's ideas before his book, before Wiener's book, it said, uh, and particularly nice for me, I think, um, uh, a particularly nice phrase I like anyways, and for people who are not full professors, um, presumably because they would have more interesting and insightful ideas than full professors, and at the Neymar conferences. Uh, Walter and Ashby can sometimes be seen as being within this tradition uh, because uh, they didn't know how their machines were going to behave. Walter saw his tortoises as behaving in ways that she couldn't have predicted. Uh, so did Ashby with his, uh, with, his, with, his, with his homeostat. They set them working 
uh, and it was only through studying them, looking at them then, uh, that they began to see how they, uh, how they, how they operated. Um, in Pickering's view, people like Pask and Bateson and, and Lang were wholly within, had escaped from the first order cybernetic tradition, and, and they, they very much embraced this performative um, uh, idiom. Uh, Pask, for example, um, we've had a great talk from Paolo about architecture. Uh, Pask with his fun palaces, the fun palace was a uh, and there's been a lot more interest in this recently, I think. The Fun Palace was a building which you built uh, and was capable of being redesigned according to the changing uh, desires and needs of the people who were using it. And of course, as it changed, then the possibilities open to those who were using it also uh, developed. Um, with Lang and Bateson, uh, you had Walter and, um, uh, and Ashby experimenting on their patients and, and trying to learn about, uh, trying to gain objective knowledge about how their brains worked and being experimenting on them. Bateson and Lang, it was much more, much more open and um, even relationship uh, with Lang's famous experiments where sane people were put together with people who, who are mental illnesses and, and artists uh, uh, and some sort of equilibrium that was supposed to develop as the human potential was explored uh, and um, sane people could go mad, just as mad people uh, might become sane. Five minutes, Mike. Five minutes. Um, psychiatry, there has been a, um, a change, so the patient is treated more as an equal, but I'm not sure how long that's, uh, whether the, to what extent that's still treated seriously, I don't know. Uh, past work, is still uh, referred to in architecture, and I'm glad uh, Paolo and his school are developing architecture in terms of cybernetics. Uh, in terms of uh, the social domain, it, it's Stafford Beer's work, which I see as most important. Uh, and this is a form of organizational cybernetics. That there's a distinction now between uh, be, 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 between management cybernetics and organizational cybernetics. I made it in 1991, others, others must have made it at the same time. Uh, Beard draws more an organismic analogy and where control is not outside the system, it's exercised throughout the system. Uh, and what matters is adaptability, adaptability and learning, uh, performativity, uh, revealing. So when he did his work in Chile, there was no master plan for the Chilean economy in 10 years time, it was to learn its way to becoming more efficient, effective and serving the Chilean population better uh, through uh, spreading control throughout the architecture of the system as the system co-evolves with its environment. I was a dean of a business school for a long time. I set up that business school on cybernetic lines, but it evolved in relation to its environment. And I could never have understood at the beginning uh, what type of business school it would have turned out being. It explored its possibilities in relation to its uh, environment. Uh, Brian Eno, the, the rock music musician, put it, uh, he was influenced by Brain of the Firm because he saw it, you, and he related this to his generative music, he said you ride on the dynamics of the system and it can create beautiful things you couldn't have conceived of uh, in advance. So, um, I think this is Andrew Pickering's quote, uh, Beer's work is not an ontology of becoming, uh, but it is within a fixed framework. And I think I would put more emphasis on the, the fixed framework than Pickering does. Because in Beer, you do get uh, many, many statements about it being a scientific model. In an argument with Ulrich, he said, it's viable systems that have set up the norms of viability themselves. So you have your systems one to five that need to be in place. That's the fixed framework and the links between them. And somehow they enable adaptation and, and becoming uh, and the ontology of becoming to take to, to, to occur. Uh, that's, that's very much uh, a, a debate, I think. It's the same with teams at Tints Integrity. You have a protocol which has to be followed and a model is, de is derived from somewhere else from Buckminster Fuller in this case. Uh, and then you get original conversations and discussions Taking, taking, taking place and what the nature 
of those laws of adaptability are in beer, uh, which enable this ontology of becoming, uh, I'm not sure. Are there any aspects of second order cybernetics in beer? I don't really think so. Um, it's an interesting idea that systems two, three, four, five can become uh, can become pathologically autopietic. Uh, as dean of a business school, I had to deal with uh, finance departments that wouldn't let me spend any money. Uh, human relations departments wouldn't let me appoint anybody. Uh, international relations departments that wouldn't let me make any links with international universities. They were, it's a nice analogy, uh, pathological autopoiesis. Uh, and the notion of structure and organization is, is useful in beer as well. Uh, and that was, comes from Maturana Ville, but nothing really of second order cybernetics, I think, in, in beer. So conclusions, uh, I think all the cybernetic approaches have something to offer in the social domain. Uh, the first order, uh, Venus work, I think, uh, I think anticipates the kind of discussion that we need to be having about the information age uh, in which we live. The relationship between uh, science and society, of technologies and, uh, and society. That's a cybernetic discussion. That's the third order type of cybernetics that was starting to be discussed in the Moscow conference. Second order cybernetics i think the most important outcome i don't currently see the the stuff coming out the american society of cybernetics going anywhere but lumen's work is is crucial i think to understanding uh, modern society uh, and uh, much unlike um, uh, von forster the, our ability to create uh, bring forth the future we want is much inhibited by the autobiotic systems of communication that lumen identifies the function systems and we can reflect on that to think of the avenues for change, the avenues for agencies that individuals have. The British cybernetics, Beer's viable system model. Well, I wish, you know, the debate about centralization or decentralization as an approach to the COVID epidemic, how much could that be better informed by anybody who understood the viable system model? But there's work to be done. We, we can't treat it as a Bible. There are different organizational forms and the model doesn't apply naturally uh, when there's outsourcing, when there's network organizations. We don't know what structures can support, best support the better, the, the organization of viability. There's empirical work to do there and people treating the BSM as a Bible doesn't get us into uh, expanding it for the, for the current types of organization that we face. And two final conclusions. Uh, there's some modesty required in and I, I say this as a systems thinker rather than a cybernetician, but I think it applies to cybernetics as well. We haven't got the solution to everything. Cybernetics has not lived up to the hope that it could provide a unified super discipline. It hasn't solved the philosophical questions that have been around since um, for two, two three thousand years. And it still depends upon those forms of thinking, whether it leans towards materialism or idealism. But it does have useful ideas and concepts to offer uh, across the range of other disciplines and they're able to draw on them very successfully. Uh, and finally, I, I, I just put this plea in, uh, let's explore the links of cybernetics with other uh, systems approaches so that they can inform one another. So one point I made was that second order cybernetics doesn't have a methodology. Checkland with his soft systems approach made the shift to the observer uh, about the same time as second order cybernetics and has developed soft systems methodology through action research, which is a way of putting that form of thinking into effect. So the systems community is far too split. Uh, let's explore the links across different systems approaches. Thank you. Can you unshare Mike? I shall try to do this. We can. We hopefully we'll see everybody again. Oh yes, uh, back. Um, so uh, Bernard Scott, you're straight in with the question, please. Well, a couple of comments to the question. I mean, the big question is uh, how is, is how is it you are uh, you, you say so little about Gordon Pask, who founded the Cybernetic Society, and uh, uh, arguably is one of the the, the biggest oeuvres of, of work uh, going in the cybernetics area, but that's 
that's I don't really you know obviously everybody has their own favorite way of looking at the at the discipline. I really wanted to point out that um, it, with respect to social systems and social you know so the social past conversation theory is very relevant. Um, it, his work is relevant. He's, he's, he's probably best known in in, in education. And when he, after he died, there was a, a fest trip for him tribute to double six. Two double issues from Kybernetes with 40, 40 papers, many of which were about uh, education. So he's, he's well known in certain areas. And we should know he was close to both von Furster and Maturana. Um, but anyway, he, he's, 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 he's hard to get to grips with in his later writings, that's true. But there is a lot to it. His conversation is a very sophisticated version of second order cybernetics. It's about observers in conversation with each other, uh, and he, he tells the full story from the, you know, the, the, the from the ontology ontogeny of humans um, to to the, the full blown social system. He's a real viable. I see him as a viable alternative to Lumen, who I find annoying for various reasons, and I'm I'm, I'm been right I'm right, right been writing about that recently. But that's another story. The other, <laughs> the other question I wanted to make was that um, is I. You, you, you seem to suggest that the second order cybernetics, second order cybernetics through von Furster and Matrana um, seem to poop, they're not scientific in some sense, but certainly Matrana would claim what he does is science. It, you know, it's based on, based on fact, biological facts, and the logic of his arguments. Um, there's an interesting paper not long ago where he, he answers questions from um, uh, some some critique. Uh, I forget the name. I've got the reference somewhere. Um, and he says that what he does is science and not philosophy, because he's been accused of being a philosopher. He says what philosophers do is adopt a position with, and then argue for it. Whereas he is a scientist, he does not do that. He works from facts. And related to that is von Furst's uh, concept of undecidable questions. This is the epistemology you find in second order cybernetics, saying that there are undecidable questions like what happened before the Big Bang and is there a God and things. And you find that I find that philosophers tend to adopt positions Sorry, with respect to undecidable to questions. Find my iPhone app. I beg your pardon? Sorry, uh, you set off my Alexa, Bernard, so don't I worry. Like, uh, <laughs> anyway, the, 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 <laughs> the reason why I'm can we stop this? Anything to say on that in relation, particularly to the Gordon Fast point? Okay. Uh, yes, I, I, mean, I, I was setting out a very broad map of the territory, and of course you can focus in on any aspect of that um, territory. And um, uh, I, 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 uh, my, my knowledge is of Pask is not is not it, it is not uh, great, uh, but I understand him to be. A very significant actor in what, at the end there, I called um, uh, British cybernetics, and I, I, I interpret his work really through Pickering's book. But uh, I accept what you say about it. Uh, the, to, to, to classify people in this way is arbitrary, in, in a sense. A lot of a lot of cyberneticians contributed to all three strands of um, cybernetics, as I as I set out there. Uh, as for Maturana, I. I so I accept, I accept the importance of Pask, basically. Um, the uh, Maturana, yes, he was uh, started off with an experimental biologist, and I mentioned what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain, the, the paper that he wrote when, when he was part of McCulloch's laboratory, uh, and that was science. Uh, my, my concern is when he, he delves into the realm of social science, about which he knows very little, um, and uh, there, I think the the work starts to lose its uh, significance and its importance. I, I don't underestimate the importance of the the concepts derived from um, uh, from the early experimental work. But Lumen had to do, uh, of course, Lu uh, Maturana Vella didn't like or didn't agree with Lumen's um, uh, Lumen translating the notions of autopoiesis to social systems uh, and using the concept of communications. But in that, von Forster was a big supporter of Lumen. So you have disagreements right across the, um, uh, the, the spectrum of those individuals. 
Thanks, Mike. Anybody else want to come in? Janos, you're on mute. Janos, you're on mute. <laughs> Switch your microphone on. Technology all gets bits in the way of the conversation. While well, Janos is, ah, he's there. No, thank you very much. That, that's uh, it's, it's uh, audible, is it? Yes. Right. But one remark and one question. Uh, the remark is that um, I believe it is possible to include or incorporate first and the idea of first and second order cybernetics into a, a methodology of creating models. And as uh, you made a uh, you, you stated that it's not possible, but I believe it is. And the question or the point that leads to the question is that I believe that um, the idea of cybernetics has created um, a lot of metaphysical speculations. And uh, perhaps there is nothing wrong with it, but it won't lead to um, an empirical theory of systems and structures. And um, what we should talk about is problem solving. And uh, problem solving includes in it, all, all these ideas, but um, it is uh, universal in the living th sphere and it is innate in the living sphere. And uh, its underlying structure is purposive systems, which is observable and the idea leads to um, the possibility of an empirical uh, theory of the systems and structure phenomenon. Oh, well, uh, that, that was your com uh, the question was, have you any comment on this rubbish that I'm talking about? Yes, well, I mean, what you've just described, I think, Janos, is, is the aims and ambitions of um, first order cybernetics, the, in the engineering approach to cybernetics. Um, I, I don't think the sort of language of problem solving um, is, is a great is, is a great deal of use in dealing with complexity because problems are so interrelated and, uh, and, and interact such, to such an extent. So for example, in the COVID really pa pandemic, I mean, what what problem are you trying to solve? That, that's the issue. There, there, there's so many interrelated it, uh, co concerns: the education of children, economic affairs, and health of elderly people um, it, it, so uh, to, to set up to set up um, as you might do to, to, to turn back to beers Bible system model as an approach to how a more decentralized although centrally coordinated approach to COVID might have wor uh, worked better uh, that that would learn its way to what was appropriate in in the circumstances faced by I don't know Le Leicester when the second wave started there or Manchester where it is now or Liverpool where it is or uh, or, or, or Hull. Uh, th there's clearly a need. Of, the, the US has adopted a totally decentralized ap approach to it and that's that's a mess. Uh, we adopted a very centralized approach to it and that's a mess. Um, uh, but the model is is highly relevant to that to, to that kind of issue. That's why it's so important to dealing with um, societal uh, issues of, uh, of, of that kind. And, it, and it's not by any means, you can't see it's a problem solving approach, I don't think. It's, a, it, it's learning your way to the best way of uh, managing is issues of, of a highly complex and interrelated nature. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else want to come in? David, are you waving your hand? David Dewhurst. You're on mute. Turn your microphone on. Oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah, just about got that. Right, no. well, thanks very much, Mike. I always regard a talk which I entirely agree with as uh, very good um, indeed. In terms of the uh, Catholic uh, conclusions about linking up with other systems approaches, uh, can I recall the virtually the only bit I recall of uh, Kant's critique of pure reason about two thirds of the way through? He states that uh, 
new subjects tend to arrive at their foundations, paraphrasing about 100 years or so after they've started. So we've got time yet, um, guys. Um, I, again, I, uh, I see second order cybernetics as one of a variety of um, approaches to trying to do science when what you're doing science on is uh, construing um, back on you. Um, if, uh, by analogy, uh, looking for the links, why hasn't cybernetics taken over the world? Um, maybe it has. I mean, possibly we, sh we would recommend any Bond villain to approach uh, cybernetics. One of my fears has always been that Dominic Cummings would appeal, uh, would <laughs> apply to join our society because some of the thinking is relevant to uh, some of the things which um, we think about. In terms of second order, the system construing back on you, can I recommend this bit of um, it, second order mycology? Uh, it's the kind of systems which, uh, it's Merlin Sheldrake, the, um, you're probably less allergic to his ideas than to his father's. Um, the, way in which entities merge into their environment, create the environment, explore the environment. And so, for example, uh, fungi may often cooperate, but then they will have a uh, seek to uh, prevent other organisms cooperating with the algae, uh, the uh, algae which they're cooperating with. So, there are a lot of wonderful cross analogies between a variety of fields. And some people are quite good or get turned on by seeing these. Again, I just want to emphasize, do you enframe things or do you try and dance and co-create with it? Well, co-creation is good when the environment's large enough for you to go on and reproduce yourself at a certain level. But just, you know, the final thought, uh, Pandemics are really good for the majority of life forms on the planet in that they reduce the number of uh, human beings which are decimating the other life forms. And it may well sort of, you know, uh, help reduce the pensions crisis and the housing crisis a little bit. So alternative frameworks, I think if we see any one person as our cell guru, we'll just uh, fight each other and split. And uh, hopefully that's not what we're about. If we can stay moderately confused, I think there's some hope for the future. Brilliant, thanks, David. Um, we've got a question on the, on the chat, Mike, which uh, from Angela Espinosa, if I can read it out. Um, so a question to Mike, what is effective organization according to Ashby and Beer is in the eyes of the observer? The VSM offers scientific criteria to value effective organization, but such criteria needs to be validated by the observer. At that level, the VSM could potentially be interpreted from the cybernetics of the observer's perspective. You should be able to see all of that on your, on your chat if you click it at the bottom of your window. And, and any comment, thought, reflection from Mike or indeed anybody at this point? Uh, I've, I've been having this argument with Angela for 20 years, at least. I thought probably that was the case. <laughs> uh, Beer isn't clear about the issue. Um, the, the, in, he, he talks about, um, clearly observers have to agree upon uh, the purpose of the system and what they're trying to achieve with, with the system uh, and uh, the boundaries of the system, the identity of the system. Uh, but once they've done that, um, my my reading of beer is that there are certain cybernetic laws which have to be followed if you want to achieve that identity and achieve that purpose and ensure the viability of the system that you're putting together to do that. Uh, and in, in uh, argument with Ulrich, he says it's viable systems that set up the laws of viability themselves. He says that Ashby's law of requisite variety is equivalent in management to Einstein's law, uh, to um, Newton's law of gravity in uh, in, in, in physics. Anybody who um, has any belief in the power of the, VS, of, of the VSM 
is believing that there's something there scientific uh, about it to which we have to pay uh, respect. It's not a matter of discussing whether these uh, laws embedded in the, the viable system model exist or not. Uh, for beer, that's a cybernetic fact. And so you have to pay some respect, uh, respect to them in one way or another, in whatever methodology you use, which employs the, uh, the, viable, system, the, vi the viable system model. Um, um, I, I'm going to do a, Andrew's invited me to do a, a Metaforum um, event on the soul of the viable system model. <laughs> and um, I, shall, uh, I, shall, I shall certainly be trying to address this issue at that stage and uh, after that presentation even Angela will be convinced about um, uh, about the need to see it as a scientific yeah. model. Hang on, hang on, but I want to somebody coming in. So Peter Dudley, would you like to come in? I think you've, you've just pinged the question at me. Oh, I've, got my, I've got my hand up. Yeah, you've, you might, your pictures aren't on, which is why we can't see your hand waving. Yeah. Can you... Bernard, Bernard here. Uh, Bernard, um, Peter's asking a question. Go, Pete. Mike, I was interested in what you had to say about first and second order observers. Uh, and wonder, given that most of the definitions that say, you know, that the second order is the cybernetics of the observer, do our second order observers in your comment, are they, are they, do we need second order cybernetics or do we need second second order cybernetics because they're observing first order observers? Uh, <laughs> you know, bear with for a second, because it's the thing that leads to the stupidity of the Lumen quote, isn't it? Where we don't have parts and holes anymore. We have systems and environments. And that's an entirely observer dependent distinction. Well, you know, he, well, Lumen, of course, knows that. Uh, and Lumen, Lumen also speculates on the need for uh, third order observers, which I think is, is Peter's point. And, uh, 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 you need, Lumen's a word that you need, that social theory needs to be self-referential. In other words, he's got to account for his own theory, uh, Lumen's version of social systems theory uh, in, the, in the theory that he puts, the, that he puts forward. Um, he, he, he's well aware of that and how far you go back of course, it's ultimately infinite that you can go back to look for third order observers, fourth order observers, etc. Yeah, that, that, that's my point. You get the infinite egress, don't you? It just goes out and, yeah. out, and out and out and out. Uh, and the, the, the Russians, I know you, you don't know the Russian work, but the, there's a guy called Lepsky who will almost certainly be present at the conference in Moscow, has defined third order as... as adaptive systems in an environment and they, they they use it quite heavily for they won't admit it but for behavior modification so there's an interesting discussion to have well yeah i don't uh, you, you're exactly right peter it was um Le lepisky or something who, who was introducing lepsky introducing third order seven minutes to me he was saying it's a relationship between um uh, it, it people and individuals and the social system of which they create and which creates them. So it was it was moving towards a sort of integrationist sociology, which actually also dates back to, and you know better than I do, to Bogdanov's work. Yeah. Um, uh, so there is that big tradition there and one can understand why they're on, on to, to third order cybernetics. I don't have any no, notion of how they, they're using it. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Peter. All right, Bernard, one last point from you. Well, well two very quick. One, one with respect to the BSM, um, there's a very nice paper by Elena Leonard, um, Stafford's uh, partner, where she discusses how the BSM can be applied to an individual human being. And that's very uh, reflexive. So you can, you can analyze yourself in terms of the BSM. That's being, that's studying the observer. So it's second order, certainly at that level. <clears throat> but with respect to the general concept of second order cybernetics, uh, von Furster says, you can indeed invoke higher orders, which he himself does when he talks about um, the I process, observing yourself as being a potential infinite order. But he said, once you're in the set, once you've gone to the second order domain, you're not adding anything new. You've got self-reference, you've got reflexivity, you've got responsibility. So by all means, construct your models with the higher orders, but you're not adding anything new. 
what some people seem to do is throw away the, the reflex phys, ref, re, reflexivity as they go up the orders and it starts looking like a, some kind of you know first order architecture that they're talking about forgetting that they are you know the ones who constructed it thank you no, that, right. that's that's um, thank you. I just say so that's that's an excellent point I, I didn't know that von Forster made that point but uh, that, that it's in a sense pointless to go beyond the second order but Lumen makes the same point that you, you get everything that you need from going to the second order without going to third or fourth or whatever the rest of it is so yeah, she has responsibility I mean, yeah, I mean, Lumen, Lumen borrows heavily from von Furster as you know yeah and as far yeah. as von Furster wrote one paper as a tribute to in a, in a tribute session to Lumen but otherwise he I mean, he's von Furster was always friendly he had good relations with everybody, but there's, there's no evidence that he bought into um, Lumen's theorizing. Mm -hmm. So that, but I, I say that because I've, I've got lots of issues with Lumen's theorizing, but it's a separate talk, separate talk. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to interrupt. Um, Janos, is it quick? Your, your microphone's on mute. It's not going to be quick then, is it, John? <laughs> Janos, you're, you're on mute. Anybody else who wants to speak? No, we're pretty, we're pretty much there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's all. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, there are still some ladies, ladies present. Um, hi, Janos, you're back with us. Go on then, briefly, please. Yeah, uh, just, just one very quick question. This uh, system uh, thinking has been in existence for about seventy years now. And uh, what do you think? Why it hasn't come up with any kind of empirical theory of systems and structures of the systems phenomenon? Um, well, I'm I'm not sure that's entirely true. It would it claim to have done so. In, in cybernetics, we we've, we've already had um, uh, Bernard alluding to Maturana and Varela's work which said something about the way the frog's eye uh, looking it, it, it sees uh, shadows and it, it, it picks flies from that it doesn't see flies um, uh, and that was empirically demonstrated you, you, but in social systems of course it's much it's much more difficult to find that kind of it's a difference between it, there's a there's a big it's a big argument about in, in general systems theory about whether you go down the road of looking for general systems laws that that, uh, that um, uh, exist right right across the domains of, of of mechanical physical systems natural systems biological systems social systems and some people still do that but frankly there's not not been a great deal of success in that in that endeavor or whether you take buildings less than seriously that emergent properties are the most important uh, things of course you get aspects of lower level uh, understanding which is relevant for higher level systems as well but you, you have to always respect the emergence uh, and the emergence at the level of human beings at the level of societies requires a different form of epistemology and different form of understanding uh, in, in order to make progress and that's not necessarily an understanding based upon uh, empiricism. Right I'm going to call it to a halt there because I suspect the questions and answers could, could, could ramble on for quite a while. Mike thank you very much that's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, can we say thank you again and wave our hands or whatever it is we, we all do to say thank you to Mike for that. Um, yeah. I'm conscious that in my schedule there's got 15 minutes of general discussion now that's clearly not going to happen. Um, what I will say is that um, on the 11th of November we have um, two new speakers uh, Professor Louise Cook from uh, Loughborough University uh, was an information and knowledge management uh, expert and she will be talking about helping the police with their inquiries so uh, that will be a sort of a, a new take on, on the information stuff and, and Ben Sweeting who's somewhere on my screen at the moment um, Ben from Brighton if I've got the right institution um, is, like Fallow is an architect and uh, it came up in the middle of the conversation Ben will be talking about undeciding the decidable next month so uh, that will be interesting. You can register now and on Eventbrite in the same way. And I really, really hope you'll be able to come and join us all again next month. I hope that's been a good couple of hours and a well-spent bit of your time. But uh, thank you all very much.